Hello there, fellow adventurers, and welcome to a long overdue interview with Josh Mandel and Richard Aronson, who used to work at Sierra Online back in the day. If you'd like to find out more about them, check out the links to the Sierra chest in the description below. Yeah, let's just go with that take. I'd also like to thank Brett Farkas for making this interview possible. He's the designer of Old King Graham a homage to King's Quest 1 featuring voice recognition technology. It features the voices of Josh Mandel and Richard Aronson reprising their roles as King Graham and Cedric the Owl. Ooh, going out for another adventure, just like the old days. That's right, but not exactly. This shopkeeper also sounds strangely familiar. Hello. Hello there, fellow adventurer. Don't mind the guard dog. I'll answer any question you need, chap, but help me with this problem. Brett Farkas is also the author of several books, including the epic poem The Bible 2, Paradise Omnipresent, a successor to John Milton's Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. And now let's go over to Josh and Richard in the Sierra Online Studios. Richard, I defer to you. All right. I'm Richard Aronson. I'm a retired game designer and programmer person who does a whole lot of weird stuff. Uh, I started at Sierra in 1991. And after I'd been there a week and learned that my game Conquest of the Longbow was going to be at least six months late if we did it as big as the design called for, that's when Roberta Williams said, I need to audition for Cedric. My head was not at all looking at Cedric. I, my head was very involved with Longbow. But I kind of figured that you know, she's Roberta Williams. So uh, that took about three weeks half time out of my out of my schedule, all of which I had to make up and didn't get paid for. I got $10 and they'd never delivered the copy of King's Quest V that they promised. Ooh, I'll wait for you here, Graham. Well, I'm Josh Mandel. I am semi-retired game designer and writer. Uh, I started at Sierra in April of 1990. Uh, I think by the time I auditioned for King Graham, I had already done a performance at the Sierra Christmas party. And on the basis of that, Ken said, hey, you're an entertaining kind of guy. You should be designing games. So that was cool. And I think if, if I hadn't done that performance, I probably wouldn't have been asked to audition for Graham. Sir, I would like to purchase one of your custard pies. These pies cost one silver coin each. I've got it right here. Here you go. One of the great things of working at Sierra was the more you worked, the more different things you're willing to volunteer for, the more doors opened for you. And that was, that was fairly new, but and I came from business programming. And that was a terrific thing about Sierra, and it just made a whole lot of people keep on trying to come up with more and different things to do that they thought might be fun. I was told, I mean, maybe they were fibbing to me, but I was told that they'd already auditioned everyone in, in Oakhurst and everyone in Fresno without finding any actor that they thought uh, could, do, could do Cedric properly. And I had a broad experience in um, in voice acting and as a fan of animation. So that's kind of why they asked me to audition, but their next step was to go to Hollywood. And that would have been very expensive because they probably would have had to replace all the other voices with Hollywood actors in order to get anyone in Hollywood to do it for them. And they were probably way over budget already. And the game was very late and uh, I'm sure it ran over budget. Almost every game ended up running over budget. Uh, one of the mentor programmers that were that was guiding me into Sierra when I started there told me that he paid for his new Jeep in cash from his overtime on King's Quest V. For my part, uh, I tried to make it a point to be a jack of all trades uh, as soon as I got there. Um, I I was brought in as a junior producer, but I did not want to produce. I wanted to design and write. 
And immediately on my very first project, I got a green light from Roberta to rewrite all the text for KQ1 SCI, the remake. And Scott and Mark wanted some of SQ4 written. I think I contributed one line to Quest for Glory 2. Yeah, I, I wanted to try to become indispensable. So when you were working on uh, the remake of King's Quest One, uh, I I believe it was your idea to uh, to change the Rumpelstiltskin puzzle, that that infamous puzzle, to make it easier. Is that is that correct? Yes, I I, I really came to Sierra um, with the mindset of a gamer uh, because I had been playing Sierra games for years and years before I went to work there, and a lot of other games as well, not just Sierra. And so looking at it from the point of view of a gamer, that was a horribly unfair puzzle. Um, Roberta was 100% on board with the idea of making it easier and also capturing more than one solution because no one knows the official spelling of Rumpelstiltskin. Richard, you, you were gonna add something? I, I, I know the official spelling of Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> Is it yep. E-L or L-E? It is E-L. Because <laughs> it comes from the German. Uh, but that's a programmer thing. I, I came in as a programmer. I'd had 10 years of increasingly responsible experience working for Fortune 100 companies, leading programming teams. And um, programmers have to spell correctly all the time because the computer only knows one spelling and the computer is always right. And Richard had a... Uh such a crazy story uh i think like getting to sierra so he was working in uh the banking industry writing mortgage software and uh came to sierra uh his friend Corey cole had invited him over his old uh D, D friend and had been there for two weeks when he was summoned by roberta to uh to be a part of this game and uh uh i know josh how long had you been with sierra when you started on kq5 for a couple of years right yeah, yeah, probably about a year and a half. And um, I had been, I was a theater major in college and I had done a lot of theater and stand up comedy in Chicago for uh, throughout most of the 1980s. Uh, you know, I tried a variety of voices for Graham and they went with the one that they thought was the most buff sounding. Josh um, is so buff. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I, I was about to ask that question. <laughs> Here, if I hold it closer to the camera, it looks bigger. What are you doing in my forest, young man? <laughs> Don't you know you're trespassing? <laughs> oh, I didn't know this was a private forest. Do you own it? Uh, Richard, like, what, one question I wanted to ask you is, um, like why why was it so difficult to find an appropriate voice actor for Cedric and like what made you write for the role? Well, Roberta described Cedric in great detail because of all the failed descriptions. And um, and I as gently as I could suggested I didn't want to do it and that wasn't going to fly. I had to audition. Um, and Bill Scott, who was the main male hero voice for J Ward Enterprises. He came up with Super Chicken by doing this to his voice, which is a great way to damage your voice if you do it for too long. So that's why I insisted on only, no more than four hours a day uh, during primary principal recording. So when you hear that cry in the sky, <laughs> you'll know it's Super Chicken. So. Um, that was hard, and my falsetto's never been the same. Uh, so I, I gave a portion of my portion of my high voice, at least, to to Cedric, and I gave him a slight upper class British accent because I kind of thought that would be good for the role. And the first time I did it, the whole th the whole thing, and I threw in the. Ooh. Um, Roberto loved it and said, that's it, you're Cedric. Oh, there's nothing but a hot, dry desert for the West. Most people avoid it because there are bandits out there. 
Oh, if you insist on going, I'll wait for you here. And Are you two ever in like the studio together, uh, recording together? Constantly. Uh, because uh, I was Josh's sidekick, um, we were the two voices that recorded together um, almost 100% of the time, except for a, a very few uh, pickup lines um, that uh, one or the other of us had to come in for. Uh, we, were, we were always joined at the hip. Well, there you are. I was just starting to get concerned. Don't worry about me, Cedric. I'm used to this kind of thing. It would have been very nice if they had continued Cedric in King's Quest VI, um, maybe even VII, uh, because they could have developed the relationship. By the time VI came out, or, or was, was even being worked on, I, I'd been transferred to the Sierra Network. And I really opposed the notion of doing more Cedric because I damaged my voice for that role. <clears throat> Cedric seems to be quietly contemplating their current situation and so is not inclined to indulge in conversation right now. Richard, I was going to ask you to say the uh, poisonous snake line, but I, don't, but, uh, but I don't want to damage your voice any more than it already is. <laughs> uh, that, that wasn't my line. That was Roberta's oh. line. That is one of the things I would have suggested as a correction. And, uh, and she would have said, kids understand poisonous, they don't necessarily understand venomous. Graham, watch out! A poisonous snake! That's the line I most wish I'd spoke up on. And I think the major factor why I didn't is that, read this line, get out of here. I was wondering, uh, was Roberta there one-on-one -on -one with you, Josh, when you were recording, like the whole time? Yes, always. Roberta and Mark Siebert were always there, prompting me to be buffer. I would be in a situation where I knew that, for instance, Graham had almost just drowned. So I would try to act like someone who had almost just drowned. And they were like, nope, nope, none of that. Keep it buff. Uh, do you have any... Uh you know, favorite lines of dialogue for, for King Graham or any anything that's specifically memorable? Oh, the scream. But you, Richard, do you have a favorite one of uh, Cedric's? Uh, I recall that Cedric had a whole lot of being useless five seconds too late. <laughs> <laughs> no, Graham, don't! Uh oh, that last step was a doozy. I mean, I hadn't played the game. I hadn't been there when the game was made. So I didn't have any context for any of the lines. I was just, you know, into this whirlwind and, oh, King's Quest, I guess it's a big deal. I play real-time strategy games. And uh, I played Quest for Glory because Corey and Laurie had given me a copy and that meant that I had to buy a $3,000 computer to play it with all 32 Roland voices. And um, it was, that part of it was kind of new to me. Computer gaming was not real heavy for me because my wife and I played beach volleyball. I was on a softball team. Uh, I, I was a super expert car rallyist. Um, all kinds of different hobbies. Uh, we played charades every chance we get. And I've been running Mensa's uh, role-playing gaming group for a decade when Corey gave it to me. This was all very different and, and very new. And if, if I'd ha just had time to read the whole script to understand what was going on, I could have done a better voice, but I wasn't going for any emotional context. I was going for keep my falsetto firm. Oh, what a sad song she plays. Let's try to cheer her up, Graham. I, I was in somewhat the same situation you were in that I, I had not played the game. I, I had actually seen bits and pieces of it, but I also did not know the context uh, for the line, so I'd have to do several readings with several different interpretations 
uh, just to try to cover all the bases. In hindsight, that's one of my big regrets because there are several lines that I thought could have been better. And in all the other voice recording I've done, uh, they were collaborative. And I didn't know that Roberta would have allowed me to do a second take of a different reading on a line and, and then give me thumbs up or thumbs down. And I did that for almost all the other voice work I did at Sierra and pretty much everywhere else. So that was kind of a mistake on my part, but I didn't understand just how open to collaboration Roberta was as long as you gave her what she had written first. So I, I was curious if, if either of you still have any, you know, uh, Sierra memorabilia that you kept from, um, from, from those days, like any artwork or, you know, software or anything like that. Do you still have anything like that? I still have my Oxford English Dictionary that um, Sierra got for me when I was working on the ruins of Cawdor, and I was tired of QA marking all of Shakespeare's words as misspelled or didn't exist. I had, until not that long ago, several Sierra t-shirts and such, but they've all worn out over the years because I'm, I'm a user, not a collector. Well, I still have uh, a couple of pieces of uh, promotional memorabilia from uh, the Space Quest series. And other than that, I just have a ton of artwork from Freddie Farkas. For instance, I still have the Main Street scroller that's seven or eight screens wide. I was wondering if you guys ever, uh you know, cross paths after working on the game very much. Like, did you guys ever like walk past each other, other in the hallway and kind of nod, you know, like you have this bond together from King's Quest? I never came up to him and said, ooh, Graham, because I just didn't have particularly fond memories of voicing Cedric, except for the interaction with Roberta, who was and remains the best director I've ever had in any kind of acting. And I knew she was the best selling uh, game designer in the world at that point. And I mostly, th the few good things were, I, I really learned from her what her target audience was and her understanding of that audience and try to expand my knowledge so that I could put some of those things in my own game someday. One thing I wanted to ask about about Cedric is like among uh, some some adventure gamers, he kind of has a little bit of a bad rap. Like, well, what? Why? Why do you think he get he gets that reputation? Uh, because he wasn't written for them. He was Jar Jar Binks before there was Jar Jar Binks, and uh, he was written specifically to make the make the children who are playing the game, the younger younger ones, have someone they could. Um, feel for and, and identify with. So um, adults who encounter Cedric for the first time as an adult generally hate him. And children who encounter Cedric for the first time as a child love him. And uh, when they played Cedric for the tours um, in the recording studio, uh, and the tours were always too large, so they had to leave the door open and everyone nearby could hear Cedric. And the adults on the tour would always be rolling their eyes and the children would always be entranced. And I think that's a part of voicing a role. If you're voicing a villain, you have to commit to being unlikable sometimes. And you know, everyone, every, every actor knows that that's ever played a villain. So um, I think Cedric did exactly what Roberta wanted him to do and I'm, glad that I was able to follow her instructions well enough to give her something she liked or maybe something she accepted. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, I was led to understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that Cedric was also supposed to provide sort of a built-in hint system. Ooh, if you follow this road along the river, you'll come to the town bakehouse. You might find something delicious. <laughs> I mean, useful there. Then if you were stuck, you could ask Cedric and Cedric would maybe prompt you along a little bit, but then he, he was breaking the, uh, 
breaking the game. So they had to have him not go into uh, a lot of places and say, I'm going to wait out here, Graham. Oh, no. Oh, I'm not going in there. Can't you read the sign? Come on, Cedric. There might be something important in here. Go if you want to. I'll wait here. One time when I was uh, teaching at uh, DeVry's game programming headquarters in Phoenix, uh, I walked into my classroom and the students said, sit down, the lights were off and one of their laptops was hooked up and they played all of Cedric's lines on YouTube, the whole opening sequence. And that's like eight minutes of really mediocre acting because exposition is always going to be mediocre acting unless you throw in a whole lot of jokes. And, uh, you know, Josh certainly knows about throwing in jokes. Richard, you know, you know what we did to him in Freddy Farkas. Cedric the Owl looks lost and out of place in the hot desert sun. If you listen close, you can almost hear him say, Freddy, if you're going to go in there, I'm going to wait out here. He always has some flimsy excuse. If you yeah. go into this one scene, he flies in and he perches and he stays there. And then if you go out and you come back in again, there's a couple of vultures picking him to pieces. As much as you want to join in, leave Cedric's carcass for the buzzards. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to ask you both about is uh, what you thought about moon logic in adventure games. For example, throwing the custard pie at the Yeti. <laughs> You think it's possible that Graham was just trying to give a pie to the Yeti and he just accidentally <laughs> killed it? It is kind of out of character for uh, Graham to just kill uh, the Yeti in cold blood. But. I, don't, I don't think that he foresaw that throwing the pie at him was going to kill him. I think that was an unintended consequence. But the hey, new logic was, was uh, very common in adventure games back then and i think a lot more accepted than it is now i think even the term moon logic did not exist back then it was just assumed that the designer was going to throw in some puzzles that were uh, difficult and obscure and the fact that we were now using a point and click interface made it that much more difficult it feels like there's there's just no excuse for it. I also want to point out that all of these games were made on tight schedules and not every puzzle can be good. And sometimes designers who are sitting there racking their brains, you know, they throw in something just so that they can move on and finish the game. Because if you don't make Black Friday, if the game's not on the shelves by the Friday after Thanksgiving, then 25 to 35 percent of the first year sales disappeared. You know, I suspect that a lot of moon logic was just the time pressure to get something done and the hope that you'll have an inspiration to fix it before it's actually programmed. Can you imagine a gamer today having the patience to get a hint on a puzzle by writing to the company and waiting and hoping that they got a returned letter with a hint. Uh, it would never happen these days. I mean, people are used to just going on the internet and finding a walkthrough uh, immediately. The gamers had a lot more patience back 30 years ago. What are, what are some of you guys' uh, favorite games that you play, like today or in the past? My favorite early game was Railroad Tycoon. It was just everything I wanted in a game, and still kind of is, though I haven't played it forever. These days, I play Heroes of the Storm four nights a week because I'm playing with Corey and Lori and, uh, and other friends. And I have all these other games queued up, but I've been so busy uh, trying to get on the kidney transplant list that, uh, that many other things have fallen by the wayside. 
My my favorite uh, game of all time is probably Planetfall by Steve Moretzky, an Infocom game. And the sequel was arguably even better. It was amazing. And I also adored Leather Goddesses of Phobos and Trinity. Today, I started playing with my daughter, Detroit Become Human, uh, which is sort of a, a modern day take on adventure games. And it's uh, really captivating. You know, I, th I think adventure games have a bright future. So, uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of working with these two guys on Old King Graham, which uh, I'm pretty sure is the very first voice recognition adventure game with graphics. And so I think we're just at the very beginnings of this kind of interactivity where, you know, everything is voice controlled. You're actually talking to people. You're like fully immersed in the game. I think this whole field is going to be absolutely huge. And you guys were pioneering all that at, at Sierra. Everyone there was trying to make a better game. I mean, bottom line, uh, there's a lot of people I thought were very lazy about it um, or had their own agenda that wasn't necessarily the best, but I don't know anybody that was setting out to ruin the game. Well, maybe there'll be a sequel. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Richard, I will be happy to explore Daventry with you again anytime. Okay, if only we could figure out a way to put us both in the recording studio. Right, right. You know, uh, there were occasional moments where we were not talking and trying to get the other one to break character. I don't know what you're talking about. No, of course <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Farewell, Cedric. We hardly knew ye.